Hey, good morning. It's so good to see y'all. So good to worship the Lord today, isn't it? I was on the phone this week with some friends. Gosh, I think it's Thursday night. Back to back to back to back phone calls. Lots of lots of people, of course, in our church. But I mean, friends here in Dallas, friends I have around the the country. A lot of people are hurting. I mean, it's one thing after another. And I don't know what you bring to this time today. We all struggle in this in this world, but I'm so glad that you're here. You made this a priority for you. And all of you who are guests, we especially welcome you. I've met some of you who are new. We had people who already join our church today, and um, we're glad you're here. And all of you watching online, I'm guessing there's a lot of people watching online today um, with you know all the stuff going on, but we're glad that you've joined us as well. Today, admittedly, often I'll say, okay, now turn in your Bibles to this passage. We are in the middle, and we're gonna, do, we're gonna jump around a little bit today is the point. Um, but we're in the middle of a series that you, you picked up on that called Patterns. We're looking at the Lord's Prayer. He gives us a pattern, but we're talking about patterns of prayer. We said that this year is really the, the year in his presence. That's every year, but a year focused on prayer. And so we have opportunities to pray. We're praying in the chapel every day uh, during the lunch hour. And you can come join us 11 to 1 if you want to find a quiet place. Lots of opportunities to pray. People gathering to pray this morning before the services. 8.30, there's a group that's in our Narthex Chapel. You can join all kinds of groups. So learn more about how to pray uh, because we want to be people of prayer. And today we get to the heart of the matter. Today, I am so hyped. Now, y'all know I kind of live hyped, but I am so pumped about this message because I can't overhype this. We are at the center of of the Lord's Prayer, and it is the center of the Christian life. It's that phrase that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is at the heart of why you and I exist. I'm not over-exaggerating this. This is the heart of the gospel, the heart of our purpose to be alive. Okay, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. So I want you to put on your, your thinking caps or your theological hat today because we're going to dive deep because I think y'all are ready. I think y'all know what's up and how, you, can, you can go there with me. But we, we struggle with what the kingdom of God is. So we're going to answer some questions around that because it's critical that we understand the kingdom of God. If we don't understand it, we don't understand what, what this whole gospel thing's about. We don't understand what the church is about. Frankly, you don't fully understand why you're here on the planet. This is that big. And, and, and so we're, we're learning how to pray the Lord's prayer and we get right here to the heart of the matter for him to, his kingdom to come through us, through me, as it is in heaven. We'll talk about what all that means. Because um, some of us, you know, understandably, the kingdom's hard to get your mind around. Uh, some of us think it's kind of like, you know, it's like Atlantis or like a lost city or something. It's buried out in the Atlantic. It might exist. I don't really know. You know, it's like Shangri-La up in the, in the Tibet mountains. It's this peaceful place that's not really there. Um, Avalon, you know, out of Arthurian British lit. Um, it's this idyllic place, and, but I don't, don't really know. And some of us think like, I'm not sure, not clear. And yet Jesus said... In Matthew 6, you might know this verse. Jesus said, but seek, what? First, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he says, and all else will be added unto you. Seek, this is big. Are you tracking with me? Seek first the kingdom. There's only one first. And Jesus says, seek that above all else. This is a big deal, all right? So to put this in context... I want us to pray the prayer again. I'll put it on the screen for you there because we're memorizing it, all right? Stacey and I are doing this. I mean, if you haven't already, we're memorizing the Lord's Prayer in the ESV to get us all around a common translation, not because not, it's close to King James, but it's not the these and thous and all that. So let's say it together, even as we read it, really as a prayer, all right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We said the prayer ends there. It's not the doxology added on the end. 
uh, is not a part of the original, or, or the, the earliest manuscripts, I should say, though some theologians have said he likely landed the, the, the sermon something like that. But this is all that we need by the, by the Spirit's leading, guiding. And we're going to focus again on that phrase. Let's say it together. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This, the coming kingdom of God, is the entire story of redemptive history. That's how big, how critical this is, all right? And this prayer of Jesus becomes our prayer. We've said that we're gonna pray like him because prayer leads to action. We need to pray more because then, then we live out our prayers. Jesus says, pray this, live this, and this prayer of Jesus will be answered and is being answered. But here's the twist. This is what I want us to get our minds around. We've been talking about this a bit. The Christian life, okay, if you're, if you're here and you're a guest, or if you're trying to figure out what all this, we're all figuring it out, really, as we grow in him. But some of you might be new to the faith, maybe been a believer for a long time. This is, this is so important. The Christian life, the gospel story, the big story, is not us going somewhere someday, like beamed up, finally, we're going to get somewhere. The story, instead, is about something that has come and that has arrived in the person of Jesus, and now he inaugurates this thing we call the kingdom of God. So we're going to answer three questions, all right? First question is, what is the kingdom? We're going to, we're going to say, what is the kingdom? I want to say, you know, where is it, and how do you find it? That's another way we're going to land by saying, how can I be a part of it? How do I live in it? All right, so, so first, what is the kingdom? Now, here's where I want you to put on your, your thinking caps, all right, with me, because I want to give you four views of of. The kingdom and what people, kind of theologians and others would say, well, it's like this. And I think it's going to help you frame, frame this so we can see how this lands. The first one, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are interchangeable, okay, terms. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Some believe it's eschatological. That's a fancy word in theology, meaning really the study of end times, eschatology. It, it's this future kingdom that's coming. And scripture supports this. Okay, really, uh, Luke 17 is all about the future kingdom. Jesus talked about a future kingdom. The whole book of Revelation is about a future kingdom. So you go, okay, there's, yes, yeah, some of the eschatological, perhaps. But why is Jesus saying, we'll pray for it to come here and now? Did he really mean that? Or did he mean like it's off? The other, a second view, is that it's mystical. It's another way or, or saying it's spiritual. And I can say, you know, scripture supports that parable of the soils that the kingdom actually is like this. It comes in us. We were praying earlier, Christ be magnified in me. You know, we call it sanctification. Let me grow up to be like Jesus. The kingdom somehow expands as the king becomes the ruler of my life. Jesus even referenced this before Pilate when he's like, what kind of king are you? You know? And then he said, so you have a kingdom. And he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Meaning like, well, okay, so it's spiritual, it's what, how, what, what does this mean? Another view is that it's political, right? And throughout history, uh, certain empires, earthly empires have claimed to, kingdoms have claimed to be the kingdom. And, and, and so you know, the moment I start talking about politics, we all get a little nervous, you know, our ears perk up a little bit because we're seeing kind of a, a comeback in that regard in our nation. In these days, which is really acutely American in a lot of ways, um, we saw a radical expression of the kingdom coming by force, you know, a year ago with the insurrection uh, on the Capitol. And, you know, you could, you, you, we could say, well, yeah, that's a real radical fringe, but, you know, a lot would claim to be evangelical Christian people. And you say, well, that's not us. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a part of that. That's crazy stuff. Radi radical fringe group. But the point is, in varying degrees, people believe, we think, that it's going to come in some political kind of way. Some political agenda will bring the kingdom. And we got Christians in politics who are, who are helping us get there. But, but some of us, we, we really believe it's going to come to a political agenda. And so cr political leaders become kind of messianic. Like if we get the right person, then it's going to come. Now we know he's not—he's not, he's, he's not savior, we, he's, but he—but he's going to help us get there. Is okay? Yes, yeah, yes. But what's key is, the, and extremely problematic today, is that, that when when Christians adopt political views that are not Christian views, 
And we're seeing this in our time. We must, we must not claim that a particular partisan politic or, or a partisan ideology aligns completely with the way of Jesus. And if that freaks you out a little bit, I would challenge you that it's because you have now adopted a political ideology, believing that it's central to the life and person of Christ. Like it lines up completely. And so what we've got to do, here's the thing. Even throughout the ages, okay, in some form of capitalism, people would say the way of Jesus is more, it's a capital. I remember reading years ago, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book. I think it's entitled, Is Capitalism Christian? And he basically answered it by saying, well, like the Brooklyn Bridge is Christian. I mean, it's, it's a framework and it's made up of people who are either Christian or not or fallen people. And, and so is, is, is capitalism Christian? Other believers would say, you know, it's the way of Jesus, actually more some form of socialism. And so we go, away. and here's the thing, my point. Jesus will not bow down to our 21st century framework of politics or a partisan way. The key is to distinguish between what is politically conservative and what is Christian. Or what is politically progressive and what is Christian. And, and to get there, we, we, we say, well... What's biblical, right? Now, unpack this with me. This is important. When we say biblical, like, like often we'll speak of the inerrancy of the Bible, that it's true, that it's, you know, and it is our authority. But what we mean ultimately is it's inerrant as long as it's interpreted like I want it to be interpreted. I become God over this thing. Now, clearly there's core that cannot be, you know, changed. But what we do is we often say that it's, it's my view of scripture and my, yeah, my collective tribe and what we believe. But, but what we see in American evangelicalism is there's this rigid precision of inerrancy that we don't see in the global church. Nor have we seen it defined in the same way historically in historical theology. See, some position inerrancy, there's a lot more to be said about this, um, not Christology as the lens through which we see scripture. And we have Jesus we have the person, the life, the words, the, the way of Jesus. That's our lens through which we measure all, all scripture. I've said it this way. Jesus is perfect theology. So if I believe something is biblical, but it doesn't match up with the way of Jesus, and you can say, well, aren't those the same? Like we read about Jesus in the Bible, aren't they? Not always. We must discern between what is political, cultural, and what is Christian. Instead of conflating our faith, and our politics. And this is really acute in America. I'm just telling you, having traveled the world, knowing believers all over the world, this is a, an acutely American thing in so many ways. So spend some time there because this is critical. The fourth view, okay, so the first one is that it's uh, eschatological, it's, it's mystical, it's, it's political. The fourth view is that it's institutional. Now, now the, the Roman Catholic Church has been a big proponent of this. Uh, and yet they don't have a corner on the market. We do the same when we think our denomination, when you get into dom denominationalism that says, we got it, we're the ones. And groups like, have done that for, you know, throughout church history. Or when we start to compete with other churches as if we're in some competition. Like we're the, we're the ones and we don't like them and they're not, they're jacked up over there. And, then we, and we, don't, we don't do that here, by the way. Uh, if you're a guest, you need to know this. We're partnering with anyone and every, everyone who's preaching the gospel and taking the gospel to our city and to the world. Uh, when I came here some years ago, I said, I mean, as the pastor, I said, I don't, my goal is not for us to be the best church in Dallas. Whatever that means, right? And that'll mean different things to different people. It's why you've landed here and not somewhere else. It's why you maybe left the church for a season you were there. It was the best church for you, but not anymore. You know, that kind of thing. It, so not the best church in Dallas, but the best church for Dallas. And that means we see what God sees. He looks down and he sees his church, his people. And yes, it's expressed and, and praise God in certain different ways all over our city. And we live in a city, I've been to other places around the world and here in the United States, but Dallas has amazing, amazing churches. But the point is this, it is to some degree an institutional thing. Even again, the New Testament would back this up. Matthew 16, 19. Peter is given the keys of the kingdom, Jesus, 
given the keys of the kingdom, some kind of authority in some kind of earthly organized institution on the earth. And so we see God works through institutions. We see it in the Davidic kingship. We see it in the priesthood. We see it in certain empires. And, and yes, through groups of people, we pray for his will to be done in our institutions, our schools, right? Our colleges, our universities. You can say that the church is a form of institution, if you will, um, in our military, and in the stock market, in your company. You can say the family is an institution, Okay, so of, of course, institutions, there's a problem. They're made up of people, of broken people. So our systems, our structures are broken as well. And, and, and so is it, what is it? Okay, what is it? What do you think? How would you answer this? Is it, you know, is it eschatological? Is it mystical? Is it political? Or is it institutional? How would you answer that? Yes, yes, yes. And yet, yes, yes, and so much more. And we're going to talk about that today. I want to really get kind of focused here. The kingdom permeates all of life, and it's, it's a part of everything. But you will never see the kingdom of God in your life and be a part of it until you understand the real story of the gospel. And I want to, I'm going to do this for a moment. Again, regardless of where you are in your faith, you're trying to figure out this whole Christian thing, or maybe you were brought as a friend, or you're watching online. Maybe you've been a believer for a lot, long, long time. I want to, I want to, here's a popular word, deconstruct the story for us for a moment. Because, because you will never see transformation in your life until you join the big story. And, and you will never, see, here it is. All transformation begins personally in your life when you decide that you will rid yourself of your own story, which we make up as children in our minds, and we develop a theology in some form, and until we align our lives with the story of the gospel, we'll never fulfill God's purpose for us in the world. And a lot of Christians need to understand this. Because many of, of us, many of our friends, our non-believing friends, our non-Christian friends, believe this is the story. It goes something like this. We have the earth, so we're talking about earth and heaven. We have earth here, right? And we're, we're living our lives here on earth. And we're trying to get to heaven because that's, that's where the good stuff is. Like, so there's earth, there's heaven, and you get to heaven by, some people believe, if there's a heaven or in some form, by being good enough, I guess. Be good, and there, like, there's a scale, right? And now be good enough. Now, most of us in, in more evangelical circles, we would say, N no, we know it's not good works that gets us to heaven. He's holy. We're sinful. It's through right belief is what it is. Right thinking, right belief. Jesus came, died on the cross for my sins. I am forgiven. I'm going to heaven. So here's earth. I believe rightly, think rightly, do good things, try to have fun. Life is hard and get to heaven. That's where the good stuff is. There's a problem with that story. And if you're going, that's pretty much the story. It's not the gospel. See, there's a problem. Namely, the Bible is the problem. The Bible doesn't teach this. This is kind of news for some of us, but I want us to unpack this. And it centers around understanding the kingdom of God. Yes, there is salvation. Yes, there is heaven. But let's talk about that. The problem, namely the Bible and the person, life, and ministry teachings of Jesus. The gospel is not about my behavior. It's not even about my right thinking. Yes, beliefs and doctrine, core, central, Christ died on the cross. He, we are sinners in need of salvation. We receive that by faith, not by works. That sets me up to live my life for him, and yes, eternity with him. But, but what we see in the scripture, that it's not about my behavior, it's about God's activity in the world. That is a way of saying the kingdom of God. So this prayer brings greater clarity for us. He's praying that his will, watch this, it rules out any idea that this is purely heavenly. That your kingdom would, would come or we'd get there some way, someday, he says, our father in heaven. Now, now, this is important to understand. We talked about this with that phrase, our father in heaven. We are not saying he's assigned off to someplace. 
To say he's in heaven, and some of us think this, we even pray this way. He's so transcendent, he's spirit, so he's so far away. And we, we even live that way. We don't rely on him personally in every single day. And when, what we said was, when we say he's in heaven, it doesn't mean we're assigning him off to some place. He can't be contained in a singular place. That's what that's saying. Heaven is wherever he is. It's not a far off place or a singular space. And in the same way to say it's the kingdom of heaven is to say it's wherever he reigns and rules as God. That's where the kingdom is. So Jesus said when he said this other dimension could come and it it could invade our space, he, he would tell parables. Like, you want to know what the kingdom is like? He would say, the kingdom is like, trying to help us get our minds around it, he would tell a parable. Matthew 13, he says this. There's a series of parables here and other gospels. But in verse 31, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes uh, a tree. So that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. And he, there's several, even just in this passage here. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Now, it's worth noting. We could go through a series of parables. It'd be a really cool series of messages. When Jesus talked about the kingdom, he talked about real life, everyday, earthy stuff. He didn't use spectacular language or images. He said it starts out small and it expands and it grows in the everyday stuff of life is what he's getting to. It spreads out. It seems to infiltrate, permeate. It invades everything and it brings life. You see that benefit brings energy to everything and everyone around it. All right. So what is the kingdom? It's wherever he rules and reigns. Let's, let's talk about this. Where, where is it? The kingdom of God, again, is, is wherever, anywhere the king reigns and rules in the hearts of his people. Jesus' first followers believed that the kingdom had indeed come and that God's will had indeed been done through Jesus in Bethlehem, okay, uh, in, in Judea, in Palestine, in Jerusalem, it had come on the cross and in the Easter garden and out of the Easter garden. We sang about kind of church history even earlier. The spirit lit the flame and Jesus' first followers have said, look, heaven and earth have now dovetailed together in the person of Jesus, the king. And so when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees in Luke 17, look at this, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. He's, he's saying, not in the way you think it's coming. Nor will they, they say, well, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst, in the midst of you. He's saying, the kingdom of God is among you. And he's essence saying, I'm, I'm, I have brought it, it's here right now. And, and, and he's saying, I am the king. He was born a king. Think about it, right? He was, he was hailed a king. He died king of the Jews. He has been more of a king than anyone ever could have imagined, but not the kind of an, a kingdom we anticipated and never before had seen ever, ever before. So here it is. I'd say it in this statement. Jesus taught us that the kingdom is not somewhere you go, but something that has arrived. So where is it? It's right here, right now. How does it come? Let's, let's talk about this. How do I find it? How do I find it? How do you find anything? You look for it, right? You, you, you look for it. Like if I'm going somewhere, you do this. In my car, I've got, I've got my little phone. I can set it up. And I've got Google Maps, Apple Maps, whatever. I've got Siri telling me where to go. Back in the day, we, had, we only had signs. We still have signs. There's a, I need to turn there. There's a sign. We look for signs. We look for signs. In fact, the whole book of John is called the book of signs because John literally says that miracle was a sign. That was a sign. 
This is a sign. Then he did many signs. He did signs here. We're looking for signs. But the first step, watch this. John the Baptist said this. Jesus then came preaching the kingdom of God is how his ministry is inaugurated. It's described, he came preaching the kingdom of God. And John the Baptist says, and Jesus said it, here's the message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus shows up. The kingdom has come, repent. So what does that mean? I'm looking for signs, I'm driving along in my life. Turn around. You're going the wrong way. That's the first step. That's the first sign of the kingdom is repentance. Because that's what repentance means. It means to turn around. The way you're going is leading to death. Your life is self-focused. It's self-obsessed. It's self-consumed. Self will kill you. And so Jesus says, turn, you're going the wrong way. You're leading to death and life apart from our Savior, apart from God. And so in Luke 4, I love this, it said, what kind of signs are we looking for? Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Maybe you know this story. And he stood up to read. Okay, back to his hometown. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, watch this, 700 years, we've talked a lot about Isaiah through Christmas and such, was given to him 700 years before Jesus comes on the scene. He unrolled the scroll and found in the place where it is written, describing the Messiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering sight to the blind, to set liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, I am the long awaited Messiah. I am right here. So watch this. This kingdom is subversive. You sense that? It's, it's, it's subversive that, it, that it's coming into what we could call occupied space. To say a kingdom is coming, then we hear about the kingdom of this world up against the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus comes into this space to release, here's here's the the manifold plan, to release Israel, defeat Israel, I mean, defeat evil, and then the return of Yahweh and his reign in the world. This fulfills all the prophecies that point to Jesus coming, and it's been God's plan all along, now implemented through the life and ministry of Jesus. So how do we find his kingdom? Look for signs of, of, of these activities. And, and more. We do the same thing that Jesus was doing. We are little Christs. We now, Jesus comes, and after his ascension, he promises us prior to, re- to crucifixion, the spirit is coming. The spirit comes and lives in us. And you might say, well, like, I mean, he did healings and stuff, and he went around, and Jesus, the signs of the kingdom were this. Here's a lame person. That doesn't happen in my kingdom. Here's a person who's blind. We're going to heal them because this is not the way it goes in my kingdom. What about the oppressed and the poor? What about the marginalized? People are sent out you know, because they're, they're um, not accepted in society, whether there's a certain ethnicity or, gosh, women or children. What about widows? That doesn't happen in my kingdom. We're fixing that. And I'm going to show you how it's done. Then he fills us up with his power to go live this kind of life. You might say, well, I've never... I've never healed anybody. I've never been a part of healing. Any Really? I was on the phone this past Thursday night. One person after another. One call after another. Loss of job. Depression. Uh, struggling with lust. Um, what was the other? Oh, uh, post-surgery. All on a single night. And I'd like to think that, that just in my listening, And then a few words of encouragement, empathy. The kingdom arrived. It shows up. It shows up in small things. It shows up in the little places. It's Christ abiding in us. It's always centrifugal. It's always moving out. And it permeates one person, one conversation, one act of love at a time. 
This past uh, Tuesday night, some of y'all were on a Zoom call with me. We, we were talking about racial reconciliation with a, with a bunch of people all over Dallas. And, and, and we're bridge building. We're trying to bridge the gap between barriers that, uh, between image bearers. God shows up in that space. The kingdom is advanced. How can I be a part of his kingdom? It's by confessing this prayer. Lord, your will, not mine, your kingdom, not mine, be done. You know, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. People ask me and have asked me through the years, particularly when I had little ones at home and kids, how do you balance your life? And a lot of us are struggling with that right now. How do you balance all the competing time demands? How do you do that? Listen, I always answer this way. I have learned this. Jesus didn't talk about balance. He never talked about balance. He talked about an all-out pursuit of one thing. The problem in your life is not balance. The problem in your life is that you don't have one all-consuming, one singular passion in your life. Jesus says it's the king and his kingdom. That's then how everything else finds its place. Are you living that way? The problem is you're trying to balance everything. C.S. Lewis um, spoke into this when he said this out of uh, the weight of glory. Maybe you've heard this quote. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but, not, but, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex, and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what it is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. The reason that many of us are struggling in our lives, we find ourselves beat down, worn out, tired, just can't quite get it together is because you don't have a singular passion in your life and you're too easily pleased by the stuff of this world. And Jesus comes and he says, no, no, no. The kingdom is your central focus. King reigning and ruling my life is how the, the kingdom advances. It comes in small ways. I've talked about this a lot in recent days. It comes in the moment. I say it this way. Where the action is in the kingdom of God is right here, right now. And it'll be true at lunch in the moment. In the, the longer I live, the older I get. Life comes down to one singular moment after another. Put your head on the pillow tonight and say, I was faithful. I was focused, big word, on that person that God put in front of me. I was focused on that act, on that thing. You say, well, Jeff, you don't understand my life, man. I mean, you're like, you're living in a church or something because my life is nuts. My job is off the rails. My kids are, I mean, it's just hard. We all struggle. I struggle. But what I'm learning is if we're faithful in the moment, we're, we're advancing the kingdom one small act at a time. And so what I want us to do as we close our time is to pray together. And I'm going to guide us in a prayer, and I'm going to ask our team to come up because we're going to sing here in a moment before we go. All right? So don't, again, don't rush out or think, I've got to get out of here. I want us to land. We've got a little bit of time. And I want us to pray. I want us to pray together. I'm going to pray two things. The kingdom of God is a lot bigger than just us right here. So I want to pray. I want to pray for others. I want to pray for, for churches in Dallas. I want to pray for the, for the churches in Dallas that are that are proclaiming the gospel. Many of you have friends in other churches. Maybe you've come from another church. Um, we want to pray for churches. I'm going to, I'm going to name some churches. We want to pray for our friends. Um, I want us to pray then for us as before we head out. Pray for you. I'm going to guide you in prayer. Whatever you've heard today, how the Spirit has led you to live out, to advance the kingdom, be his presence in your life one moment at a time this week, okay? So let's all, let's just close our eyes. And I want us to guide, guide us in prayer. And then we're going to close with a proclamation, a song together. All right? So I want us first, if you'd join me, think about um, churches that you know. Maybe it's a church that you, maybe it's near your home. Some of you drive past other churches to get here. Maybe it's right there in your community or your neighborhood. Maybe you have friends 
Just pray blessing over them. I want to pray for, think of Northwest Bible Church, really close by, across the street. Neil Tomba, my friend, is pastor there. Pray for, pray for them. What a great church. Pray for Highland Park Press. Brian Dunnigan is a really good friend, encourager in my life. Pray for them. A great church reaching this community in particular. Pray for Highland Park United Methodist. A great work in our city. For Paul Rasmussen, his staff, his team, members there. Pray for Park City's Prez. Mark Davis is, is again, a good friend for many years and co-laborer in the gospel. Pray for them. Many of you have friends perhaps there. Let's pray for Concord Church. For Brian Carter. So many of us know our friends there, people there, staff. Epic Fellowship Church. Would you pray, Lord, bless them. That's a church we partnered with Concord to plant. Last week was the launch. Official launch. Pray for Marlo McGuire, the pastor. Pray for Watermark Church. What a great uh, influence the church has had. Pray for them. Um, pray for our friend Blake Holmes, who's kind of a key elder there and a good friend, longtime friend of us, our church. John Elmore, Timothy Atee, those who are now in, in the teaching on the teaching team, preaching team. Pray for them. What a What great influence. Praise God. Pray for Cornerstone Church. Pray for Chris Simmons. In my mind, arguably one of the greatest churches in Dallas that I know of. Work they're doing in South Dallas. Pray for others. You met Shoreline City or Preston Hollow, Prez Eastside community. Pray for all, all the nation's partners. A Vickery Baptist Church and Healing Hands a Community Church we've launched with Sal, Sal Rivas. For the Zomi Burmese Church. I pray for Pastor Helen today. Lord I God, I pray for the church in Dallas. We all collectively pray for your will to be done through your, through your people here in Dallas and around the world. And now pray for yourself. Pray for God to advance his kingdom through you. And I'm going to give you a moment, just space, to think about your your life, your place. Home, school, work. Now pray that you will advance the kingdom. Maybe people in your life come into your mind right now. Who will you see this week? Some we don't know, but maybe you know who's in your life that needs encouragement, that needs to be blessed. Let the Lord bring faces, people to your mind. And if you're struggling, friend, if you're going, man, my life, my, my work is hard, remember this as you pray. Lord, may your kingdom come through the dark and difficult moments of my life. That's where he really shows up. Light shines bright in darkness. Lord, yours is the kingdom. It's the power and the glory forever. And we pray that your will would be done through us as we proclaim it together. In Jesus' name. I want us to all stand together before we go. Would you do that? Let's stand. The team's going to lead us as we proclaim together.